this week on Brian Ross Investigates, the White House as Conspiracy Central. I ask that you get checked out. The president spreading the unfounded conspiracy theory that TV news host Joe Scarborough may have murdered one of his staffers when he was in Congress. Hopefully someday people are going to find out. It's certainly a very suspicious situation. Investigative reporter Mike Isikoff of Yahoo News gets to the bottom of it. This is a completely baseless conspiracy theory. And his exclusive interview with the husband of the woman who died from a pre-existing heart condition. When there's a raw open wound. Every time it starts to heal up, it gets a little tougher. Plus, the amazing video of a U.S. Delta Force operation to rescue hostages from ISIS in Iraq. That led to the country's highest military honor for the man who led the mission. Pat, you embody the righteous glory of American valor. All at the very time the president was being accused of calling members of the military losers and suckers and our winners and losers in the media, as chosen by the editors of Mediaite. Should Bob Woodward have gone public sooner with the president's revealing comments? To be honest with you. Sure, I want you to I be. wanted to, uh, I wanted to always play it down. From the Law and Crime Trial Network, this is Brian Ross Investigates. Good evening and thank you for joining us and welcome to our viewers on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. I'm Brian Ross, joined tonight, as always, by my colleague, Rhonda Schwartz from the Law and Crime Network. And Rhonda, we begin with the White House as Conspiracy Central. And one of the more outrageous conspiracies being spun by the president is an allegation against one of his most vocal critics, TV host Joe Scarborough, suggesting that Scarborough, when he was in Congress, somehow murdered a female staff aide who worked for him, Rhonda. That's right, Brian. And at the heart of this story is the tragic death of a young woman, Lori Klesudis, some 20 years ago when she worked for Joe Scarborough when he was then a congressman. And as always, the question with conspiracies is how and whether to try to put them to rest, how and whether to stamp out a preposterous lie. As MSNBC host Joe Scarborough, a former Republican congressman from Florida, stepped up his criticism of President Trump on his program Morning Joe. I don't look at Donald Trump and say, why can't he help himself? Why can't he fix himself? Why can't he be at least competent? Because he has proven time and time again he just can't do it. That just suggests that you're not well right now. You still... Don't get it. The president fired back, calling on Twitter with no evidence to back it up for Scarborough to be investigated for the murder of a female staff member, Lori Klausudis, when Scarborough was in Congress almost 20 years ago. The president's tweet to his 80 million followers gave huge exposure and new life to a baseless, lingering right-wing conspiracy theory about Scarborough and his former aide. And Scarborough was outraged. And you actually tweeted something uh, extraordinarily cruel. Um, and I know you meant to be extraordinarily cruel to me by attacking me, by bringing up a conspiracy theory that has lived in the gutters of the Internet for some time now. But just like the Seth Rich conspiracy murder uh, 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 that was pushed by your allies, you don't understand the pain you cause. You cause to families who have already lost a loved one. I ask that you get checked out. Mm -hmm. I ask that you take a rest. I ask that you take care of yourself. Maybe let Mike Pence run things for the next week. You're not well. We're joined now by Mike Isikoff, the chief investigative correspondent for Yahoo News and host of the podcast Conspiracy Land, which deals in its latest episode with these Joe Scarborough allegations and rumors. And Mike, let me start by asking you, sometimes conspiracies are built on a small grain of truth and distorted. In this case, is there any grain of truth? 
Uh, in short, no. Uh, this is a completely baseless conspiracy theory uh, that actually was originally cooked up by diehard Democratic partisans in 2001 as a way to stick it to a then-sitting Republican congressman. Uh, in fact, it was all baseless. Uh, the police investigated. There was no evidence of foul play whatsoever. Um, she, There was a... Uh, uh, a, a medical autopsy that found she had had an undiagnosed heart ailment that caused her to faint, lose consciousness, bang her head. Then, years later, nearly two decades later, when Donald Trump is having his blood feud with Joe Scarborough because of his criticism on the Morning Joe show, Trump revives this baseless conspiracy theory, starts tweeting it left and right. There was nothing to support it, yet it went out to the more than 80 million followers of Donald Trump on Twitter, then gets picked up by the QAnon conspiracy crowd. And it's really sort of a case study in how baseless conspiracy theories can get traction in you know this new age of social media, thanks to the president of the United States. And yet he's continued to double down and suggest there's something suspicious. Listen to what he had to say at the White House News Conference. The second question was about your tweets about the, the woman who died, who you're suggesting that Joe Scarborough was responsible. Yeah, a lot of people suggest that. And uh, hopefully someday people are going to find out. Uh, certainly a very suspicious situation, very sad. Very sad and very suspicious. So, Mike, what's the reaction from Lori's uh, husband to see Trump doing all this? You talked to him. Yes, I did. This is the first interview he's ever done. I mean, he is appalled and distraught um, that these uh, conspiracy theories about the death of his wife continue to get circulation out there. They cause pain. He says at one point it's like a raw, open wound. When there's a raw, open wound, every time it starts to heal up, it gets a little tougher. Here comes another one of these events in this that sort of peels the scab back and re-exposes it. And here we are 19 years later. I should not be having to worry about having a fresh open wound on this. You know, this whole story, this whole conspiracy, everything else, it actually has nothing to do with her. She's just an asterisk. She's just a footnote. She's what gives it a little sizzle. And, and it's unfair. You know, her, her life, her being, her goodness will never, ever be remembered. It's only going to be all this other crap. It's just been unfair. It's just been completely unfair. It's, it, this woman deserves so much better than I had or have the ability to do for her. And, uh, you know, he made this poignant plea to Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter, in a letter last May pleading with him to take down the president's false and uh, tweets about the death of his wife. And, and, then, and then Dorsey, essentially, at the stockholders meeting, said, we don't, we don't uh, censor public officials. We also believe that it's important that people have conversations around uh, what's happening, especially with our global leaders. What was the husband's reaction to that? We played it for him, and he says, that's bull. Well, that's a bunch of bullshit. It's bullshit. It's, this was not an issue that was important to our society whatsoever. And finally, Mike, let me ask you, why do Americans so love conspiracy theories? Well, uh, that's an excellent question. I think that um, uh, we are all fascinated by them because uh, they provide an explanation for events that are at times uh, murky and uh, uh, um, and and unclear and to. To, to come up with a good, juicy conspiracy theory that explains it all, especially if it fits one's political narrative. And this is a classic example. Remember, who, pushed, who first pushed it? It was Democratic partisans, because 
you know, a way of, of taking a, a, a of taking a swipe at a Republican congressman. It furthered their political agenda. And then years later, it migrates to the political right and uh, Donald Trump picks it up and, you know, his followers jump all over it. And uh, so, you know, these conspiracy theories, when they fit our preconceived political narratives and prejudices uh, really can catch on. All right. Michael Lizikoff, chief investigative correspondent at Yahoo News and host of the podcast Conspiracy Land. Michael, thank you so much for being with us here tonight. Thank you, Brian. Coming up next, honor and dishonor at the White House. When we come back, you're watching the Law and Crime Trial Network. Next, the commander-in-chief and the White House approach to those who have given their lives. We begin with the story of an American hero who was honored last week at the White House by a president who has disparaged openly those who have given their lives for their country. Our mission was to conduct a hostage rescue raid on October 22, 2015 in Hawija, Iraq. For this mission, I was assistant team leader. My team was responsible for one of the buildings that the hostages were being held in. What was significant is that there were freshly dug graves, and if we didn't action this target, then the hostages will probably be executed. At that point, it was our duty to bring those men home. We cut the locks on the prison doors and opened the cell, and you know, over 25, about 25 hostages in, in one cell, and probably 11 in the other. And um, you see their faces light up, and they're being liberated. And uh, some are crying, some are excited. And while this is going on, there's still an intense firefight going on in another building. You can see the flames, you hear the, all the explosions going on. Pat, you embody the righteous glory of American valor. It is now my privilege to present Sergeant Major Thomas Patrick Payne with the Congressional Medal of Honor. To talk about this more, we're joined now by Karen Greenberg of the Center on National Security at the Fordham School of Law in New York, and by retired Navy Commander Guy Snodgrass, who is a former speechwriter for Secretary of Defense James Mattis, a Top Gun pilot himself, and out just this week, his new book, Top, Gun, Top Guns, Top Ten. And Commander Snodgrass, let me start with you. How do you reconcile uh, the president giving this Medal of Honor with what he's reportedly said about the military uh, behind their backs? Well, I think always there's the just the reality that what you do in public doesn't always align with what you say or how you feel in private. Uh, I'm glad to see that the president did recognize the service member. And of course, I think the service member himself would tell you that he's simply the individual receiving the award uh, or the recognition in this case. Uh, but that, you know, this is a, a recognition that's really reflects more on the men and women that he has served alongside during his entirety of his career. But it's great to see him being recognized. Karen Gringmer, let me ask you this. Uh, the president's comments have received a lot of publicity, a lot of attention. How are people in the military reacting to all of that? I think that there's um, a, a growing schism between the president and the military. It didn't start just with the Atlantic article. It's been persistent throughout his actually administration. He's been a two, a kind of two-faced towards the military. On the one hand, he loves the pomp and circumstance of the military. He likes surrounding himself with generals in the early days of his administration, but he doesn't like to be tethered. And in the wake of George Floyd, in the wake of the protests, and now with the election uh, chaos pending, the military is really taking a step back from the president um, on a number of issues, uh, discrimination being one of them, not wanting to interfere in um, domestic politics being another one of them. So I think you see a schism that is only going to intensify rather than uh, die down or wane. Commander Snodgrass, a question for you from Rhonda Schwartz. Rhonda? 
we've seen your former boss, General Mattis, and General Kelly comment about this. In They've had written comments. Do you think they'll speak out publicly during this election cycle? I'm not sure whether or not they're going to speak publicly, but I do, I, I have a kind of a sneaky suspicion that that's what we're going to see more of in October. Uh, Bob Woodward's book was also released today. Uh, as one of the breaking tidbits from that book was the fact that he quotes Secretary of Defense James Mattis, as, along with former Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats, as saying that uh, they're deeply concerned by President Trump's actions, and, they, and they're wondering with Bob Woodward whether or not they have a, an obligation to step forward and speak truth to power and also to share what they know with the American public. And so I think as we get further into this election cycle, as we get our or make our way into October, you're much more likely to see individuals who served in this very administration stepping forward with their feelings about a second Trump administration term. Commander Snodgrass, you talk in your new, new book about uh, leadership lessons learned from the cockpit. How would you assess the leadership of Donald Trump as the commander in chief? Well, I think going back to some of the points we made previously, uh, when you take a look at how the military approaches leadership and the concept of leadership, it's, it's a profession of arms. It's driven by uh, adherence to legality, staying within the ethical midfield, uh, putting service before self. And so one of the, my favorite terms of all time is, to, is that a person's actions speak far louder than their words ever can. And so that's where President Trump is now having uh, some difficulty with the military, is the fact that although sometimes he will praise the military in public, his words in private betray his true feelings. And also the way he responds is not what the military members have been led, have been trained their entire careers as how a good leader should act or should behave. And that's the fundamental disconnect that exists between President Trump and the military he leads, leads let alone many of the other members of the professional part of the administration. And Karen Greenberg, what's the impact, what's the result of this kind of a schism between the military and the commander-in-chief? It puts the it military, it, yeah, it puts the military in, a, I think, a very difficult situation. And you've seen, I, I don't know if you saw, I'm sure you did see that um, a number of national security officials signed a letter recently uh, disavowing Trump and supporting Biden. You've seen more and more military people uh, come out and say things that are very strongly against uh, the president, including Admiral McRaven, who called it shameful and called them being embarrassed. I mean, I think that this is the the idea that the military can can stay separate from politics is a fundamental principle of how the military operates. And now they're being put into position where they really have to distinguish what is politics and what is patriotism. And I think you're seeing more and more of them identify with the idea that patriotism means standing up for the values. They don't have to even put Trump's name on it, but there are certain fundamental values, and they've been put in this position. And my guess is, I, I agree, I think we're going to see more and more statements, and not very oblique, I think some very direct statements, talking about the way forward for this country. All right, Karen Greenberg uh, from Fordham School, thank you very much. Commander uh, Guy Snodgrass, thank you both for being here tonight. Really appreciate it. Coming up next, the winners and losers this week in the media. I take a look at Bob Woodward's new book, Rage. Back now with winners and losers this week in the media, as chosen by the editors at Mediaite. And we're joined by Aidan McLaughlin, who's the editor in chief of uh, Mediaite, which, like the Law and Crime Network, is part of the Dan Abrams media empire. And Aidan, let's start and talk only about Bob Woodward, his new book, Rage, an incredible tour de force with all those on the record interviews with President Trump all on tape. Here's a clip of one of the things the president talked about with Mr. Woodward. It's also more deadly than your, you know, your, even your strenuous flus. For, this is uh, more right. deadly. This is five per, you know, this is 5% versus 1% and less than 1%, you know, so this is deadly stuff. Well, I think, Bob, really, to be honest with you. Sure, I want you to I be. wanted to, uh, I wanted to always play it down. I still like playing it down. Yes, sir. Because I don't want to create a panic. So Aiden, no doubt a big winner. His book, Long Awaited, made a big impact. 
Yeah, I, so it's a it's a pretty huge release from Bob Woodward. Uh, I have the book here. Uh, it's called Rage. Uh, it follows his previous book about uh, the president of Donald Trump's administration called Fear. Uh, now, the difference between the two books is that President Trump did not participate in Fear, uh, as opposed to Rage, the new book, where Trump gave 18 on-the-record interviews to Bob Woodward. Um, and Bob Woodward, you know, you hear in the audio tapes that Woodward has released uh, from these interviews, you can hear, hear him clearly saying that he's going to start his recorder and that he's that the president is on the record. And the president proceeds to, you know, dish out some pretty remarkable uh, things about the way his administration has responded to the coronavirus pandemic. Um, that was the big splashy headline uh, that came out last week from this book before the book was even published. Uh, that basically the president back in February knew the dangers of the virus, uh, said that it was incredibly deadly, as in that clip that you played, uh, and that later admitted in early March that he wanted to downplay it deliberately uh, because he didn't want to cause a panic. Uh, now, there's a lot of flaws in, in uh, you know, the leader of a country saying uh, that they wanted to downplay a deadly pandemic, perhaps by misleading the American public. Um, because they uh, didn't want to create a panic of some sort. Um, but it was a really remarkable headline from Woodward's book. Uh, it was one of many. Uh, there's a ton of really interesting reporting on, for example, the Secretary of Defense, James Mattis, uh, who left the administration over disagreements with Trump about how he thinks that the president is a danger to the Constitution. Um, and, you know, it's hard for the president to dismiss this book because he gave 18 on-the-record interviews to it. And, in fact, he was asked about the book on Fox & Friends this morning uh, and uh, did not dismiss it as fake news. Uh, he said that he read the book, that he thought it was boring. I'm sure a lot of people would disagree, um, but he didn't contest uh, its reporting. So I think it's certainly a win for Bob Woodward. And in just 10 seconds left here, uh, was there a mistake he made in not releasing it sooner? There's an argument to be made there. You know, he was reporting this for a book. Um, it would, I think, you know, at the time he said he wasn't sure whether it was true what Trump was saying about the virus being as deadly as it was. Um, right. You know, there's a debate. I think he's defended himself well on that front. All right. Aidan McLaughlin, thank you so much for joining us. As always, very interesting. And thank all of you for joining us. And thanks to our team at Long Crime for getting us on the air and, of course, off the air.